Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next edition of the BioExcel webinar series. My name is Rosan Apostolov, and I will be today's host. The webinar series today are brought to you by BioExcel, which is the leading center of excellence for computational biomolecular research in Europe. In our series, as you might be familiar with them, uh, we feature notable scientists and their work in the domain of computational biomolecular research, developers of popular software applications, new release tools, which uh, we believe might be of uh, interest uh, for you. We also have a series of educational webinars for those who are new to the field. Last but not least, we also present major achievements and results of work done in our center. And we hope that the series will be of interest to you and will bring value to your research work. In particular, if you'd like us to invite specific spe speakers or feature given topics, please don't hesitate and contact us. You can visit our website, bioexcel.eu, for more information and contact. With that, I would like to present you Gareth Tribello, who is uh, our speaker today. He did his undergraduate and PhD at Oxford University and uh, uh, UCL, respectively. Then he spent uh, many years working with uh, Professor Michel Parinello at ETH Zurich and University of Lugano before getting a lectureship at uh, Queen's University of Belfast, where, he's, where he is currently working. Uh, he's doing a lot of research on machine learning algorithms for analysis of molecular dynamics trajectories and his focus recently on simulations of uh, crystals. He's also one of the four core developers of the Plumed plugin for molecular dynamic simulations, which is the main topic of our presentation today. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome Gareth, and uh, I will now let him continue with the presentation. Okay, so, I'm going to assume that everyone can hear me. Uh, welcome to this presentation and uh, thank you for being here today. What I'm going to talk, and thank you Rosten for that um, nice introduction. What I'm going to talk a, a bit about today is the, um, the software plugin Plumed of, of which I'm one of the developers. Because I always forget, um, I'm going to put the, the publications on the first slide of the talk so that I don't forget this time. So the very first publication about Plumed is this one here. Um, that was written 10 years ago. So this year we're celebrating 10 years of Plumed and we had a conference earlier in the year to celebrate that in particular. Then we rewrote Plumed in 2014 and we wrote this paper about um, Plumed 2 at that time. And just this year um, we started this Plumed consortium uh, which was an, an effort to try and have openness, transparency, and reproducibility in molecular simulations. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our efforts in that direction towards the end of the talk. So in terms of the outline for my talk, what I'm going to talk about first is really what Plumed is and what it's for. I'm not going to have a lot of time to go into a lot of the details because we've only got an hour. Um, and then I'm going to show you some example applications and just show you the range of different ways that it's used. Um, then I'm going to talk about the Plumed Consortium and what we're working on now. And I'm going to finish by talking about what our plans are for this particular piece of software in the future and the direction in which we're trying to move. Okay, so in terms of our community, we sometimes talk, talk in terms of this division between users of software and developers of software. And I've always felt a little bit uncomfortable with that division because even though I write and work on a piece of software, I don't feel like I'm a full-time software developer. I feel I'm very much also involved and primarily driven by the applications. And I don't really want to get into the details of making sure that my code is load balanced. I mean, these things are important undoubtedly and it's great that we've got people that want to do that, but that's not my primary focus. And so being one of these people sort of who are between this, what we, we realized a few years ago was that we needed something that would allow us to operate between these two worlds, this world of software users and software developers. And I have there a picture of the other developers, Carlo, Max and Giovanni, uh, 
who are involved in the development of this plumed package. Now, the reason that we developed Plumed, the origin of it, was that we were all working in the same group, the group of Michele Paranello, and we were working on the development of this method, metadynamics, and various other relate, related methods. And what we found was that every few years, we had to, in, to write these pieces of software into another code because we would need some other application or because some other code was not being maintained. And it got to a certain point where sort of Gromax appeared and we set down to implement metadynamics in this again for the umpteenth time. And thankfully, Carlos had the genius idea of saying, what if we do one piece of software that works with all these codes, rather than every few years having to rewrite this stuff again, because we need some other functionality that's not in the particular one of the codes that we have that's already implemented in. So that's the kind of genesis of Plumed. What it actually does is you have your MD code there, which does what an MD code normally does. Essentially, it calculates forces and it integrates Newton's equations of motion. Beside that, you stick plumed. We call it a plugin. Other people who are not as nice as us call it a virus. Um, it, during the initialization, there's some initialization done, but the important thing is that at every single time step, just after the calculation of the forces, the MD code passes across the positions to plumed so Plume can do various forms of analysis, calculate various different things. And Plume then has the possibility to pass back forces. And by passing back forces, obviously affect how the, the trajectory and basically how the equations of motions are integrated uh, or what is integrated. So to illustrate the sorts of things that Plume can do, this is an example Plume input file. So each line in this example is one what we call plumed action. So we have actions that do various different things. Some of them calculate things like centers of masses, distances, various collective variables, and then we have other actions that calculate a stimulation bias. What you can see in this input file is um, each of the actions has an associated label. So if you look at the very first line in that file, you'll see that it reads C1 colon com atoms equals one to 10. So this is calculating a center of mass. And it's telling us that later on in the input file, if you see the symbol C1, that means use the center of mass that is calculated by that first um, com command. And the same holds everywhere in the input, everywhere else in the input file. So if we take that input file and turn it into a kind of graph, this is how basically data is passed through the code. So we start off with the MD engine. This passes the atomic positions into the plumed. As you can see, those atomic positions are passed into these two COM commands, and they calculate these two centers of mass positions, C1 and C2. Those centers of masses are then passed to some of these collective variables. These collective variables, the, this is angle, torsion, and distance, can also take the atomic positions from the MD code. We can then do functions of collective variables, and we can do simulation biases. And in the end, all of that data is passed to the print command that is within that um, input, and that basically outputs whatever it is the user wants to output to a file. Okay? This is not the end of the story, though. We have a, a loop where you go through, forward through this list of actions and you calculate these, um, quant these biases that depend on functions of collective variables, or on collective variables and virtual atoms. But because we're applying forces um, onto the atoms, we also need to calculate the derivatives of all these quantities so that we can, with the chain rule, basically apply the forces um, backwards through the code. So this is the sort of second step is what happens going backwards is we take our, um, our biases, we calculate the negative derivative of the potential, which is obviously the force. We calculate that with respect to the collective variables that were input, and then we, we basically propagate whatever the output of the action is, the derivative with respect to the input. And by doing this process going all the way back, we eventually get back to the forces that we're going to apply on the atoms within the molecular dynamics code. There's one last thing to point out with this, which is that if you look and think about what this input is doing, um, and you look in particular at the quantity T1, the torsion, the only thing that needs that torsion is the print command, and that print command is only run every 100 steps. 
So it's computationally wasteful to calculate that torsion on every time step. So what we have is what are called pilot actions. Um, uh, the particular pilot actions in this case are the upper wall and the metadynamics bias. These need to be calculated on every step and the print command, which needs to be calculated every 100 steps. And basically these pilot actions control when the other um, commands are run. So for instance, that torsion action, which is only done every 100 steps, is only calculated every 100 steps. It's not calculated on every step. Um, and you have this basically avoidance of computational expense. For a torsion, it's not much computational expense. For something more expensive, like a coordination number, this can give you a considerable speed up. Okay, so that gives you a rough outline of what um, Plumed can do. So essentially, it takes in the atomic positions, calculates functions of those atomic positions, and calculates the derivatives of those functions so that you can propagate back bias potentials. What I wanted to do in the second part of this talk was talk a little bit about some more complicated examples and talk really, explain really why you would need this structure in, of this, why we need this extra code. Because the examples that I've given that far, thus far, they're not actually that complicated to implement. And you might argue that it just makes more sense to have these in the underlying MD engines. So my first example is really, is about studying inflexible interfaces. And this is some work that I did um, recently, I think two years ago now. Um, and this really started off as a collaboration with this um, Mario Del Popolo person who's based in Mendoza in Argentina and his former postdoc who then became my postdoc, um, Joaquin Klug. And the problem that they were interested in involved basically the binding of um, nanoparticles to biological membranes. Okay, and I've got an, an example picture showing the, the, that binding process up the top of the slide, which you can hopefully see. So we had a, a grant whereby we had this um, transferability and mobility between Argentina and, um, and Belfast. We definitely got the good end of that deal. Uh, and um, they came with this particular problem um, with regards to doing these calculations with the membrane. So what they were doing was they were using, they were basically calculating the position of the center of mass of the membrane and using the distance between the center of mass of the membrane and the center of mass of the nanoparticle as a collective variable in their calculations. And what they found was that the membrane was doing all sorts of weird things like this. So the membrane would bend during the simulation, the center of mass would be in the center of the cell, um, and uh, and it would not be indicative at all of the distance, the distance between that center of mass and the, um, the position of the nanoparticle would not be indicative at all of the distance between the, the, the nanoparticle and the surface of the membrane. So they were interested in, can we basically come up with a collect, better collective variable that is able to deal with the fact that this is some flexible object and that is more able to accurately say whether you're inside or outside of the membrane. So if you look at that particular picture there, for instance, the distance between the center of mass of the membrane and the nanoparticle would be negative, which would you would assume would mean that the nanoparticle is inside the membrane. But as you can see, the, the nanoparticle is actually sat on the surface of the membrane. So our idea to solve this problem was to say, let's suppose that your nanoparticle is here and it's and you look down basically in the direction perpendicular to the surface of the membrane at the density of atoms along that thing. So for each atom that you find along that particular direction, you add a Gaussian kernel and you build the a model of the density. Okay, so you see now that that density is located on the z-axis about where those, those three atoms of the membrane are. If we then move, we do that same thing, but we do that for a different X and Y coordinate. So now you see that the membrane is slightly higher and this density field moves to a higher point. And we can do that again over here. And you see again, that density field moves to a different place. So we're just using some Gaussian kernels along the direction um, perpendicular, to the, perpendicular to the surface of the membrane and the particular X and Y coordinates. And each, atom is just re re represented by a Gaussian kernel. 
Okay, so that's a kind of schematic representation. This is what you get out um, when you do that analysis. You get a, a graph that looks something like this. So here you have the on the the x-axis of this graph the z coordinate, and on the y-axis you have the density of membrane atoms. And the idea was, well, we take a particular de value of the density, let's say 0.5, and we say, where does this density drop to that particular value? So essentially, we find the root of this curve. We look for the p of the, the value of p of z, where this is equal to some particular value gamma that we're interested in. Okay, so you see, I'm just reading off from the y-axis where the density goes to that particular value. Now, the slight problem with this, as you will have noticed, is that there are actually two z values that satisfy this equation, one for the top surface of the membrane and one for the bottom surface of the membrane. But this is not really a problem, it's in, and it makes total because it makes total physical sense. The membrane does have a top surface and a bottom surface. And in practice, when you actually do the calculation, what you need to do is just pick which one of those two distances to use. Normally, you're going to use the, the, the shorter of those two when you're looking at it. So the, 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 the membrane surface that is closer when you're constructing um, your free energy surface. For the actual process of doing the, um, if you want to use this as a bias, what we found the best thing to do was to assume that those are the two, those two distances are the roots of the quadratic equation. And so it's basically to use um, the product of them as the um, collective variable. So that's a, a, a nice example of this, a, a really a quite complicated CV that I don't think you would really want to be implementing in lots of different pieces of software because you know, there's quite a bit of code within that that had to be written. On top of that, there's a kind of a trick missing here because okay, you've got this nice CV that measures the distance between the nanoparticle and the surface of the membrane. But there's all sorts of things that we can do if we have information about the height of a fluctuating interface. For example, there's all of capillary fluctuation theory that allows us to extract things like the surface stiffness of the membrane. So as well as trying to um, implement the, this particular methodology, Whilst we were doing this, we also looked at seeing whether we can basically construct the, um, the height of the membrane on a sort of contour plot. And so we implemented that as well. Um, we basically we calculate um, the, the manifold of points that are, that are on that surface, and we can build plots like this, which shows the height of the membrane, the height of the surface of the membrane as a function of X and Y, okay? And in fact, we went even further than that because, as I as was said in the introduction, I'm interested in the process of crystallization. And in crystallization, we don't have a nice situation where, especially if we're looking at crystallization from the melt, where you have one atom of one type and another atom of the other type. If you have a solid liquid system, all of the atoms in the solid are of the same type as the atoms are within the liquid. So the first thing you need before you can even get to this question of where does the solid end and where does the liquid start is some um, mechanism, some symmetry function that allows you to tell whether an atom is part of the solid or part of the liquid. Now, thankfully, lots of those sorts of coordinates exist. Many of those are implemented in plumed. You can use things like um, Steinheim order parameters, coordination numbers, um, and various other things. In this particular instance, what I'm using is a, a cubic harmonic function. And this cubic harmonic function, um, if I look at this graph, what I've done is I've calculated this, the value of the cubic harmonic function for the atoms within a solid, that's the blue histogram, and I've calculated the cubic harmonic function for the atoms within a liquid, that's the red histogram. And what you can see is that there's very little overlap between the distribution of this quantity for the atoms that are in a solid and the distribution of this quantity for the atoms that are part of the liquid. So I can, what I can do is I can take those, the values that I get, I can transform them by that black dashed line, which is just the switching function, and I can eventually get to a quantity that if I calculate a function, that if I calculate that for a solid-like atom, will it be equal to one, and if I calculate that for a liquid-like atom, is equal to zero. 
So I'm thus able to introduce a tag on each of the atoms that tells me whether a particular atom is part of the solid or whether it is part of the liquid. And uh, this is what I've done here. So this is a box of just Leonard Jones atoms, just standard good old Leonard Jones. But all of the blue atoms have this um, symmetry function that measures the degree of solidness close to one. So these are part of the solid. And all of the red atoms have this symmetry function close to zero. So these are part of the liquid. And what you can see is I have um, a region of the box where you have solid and a region of the box where you have liquid. So the nice thing is, if I now take those symmetry function values that I get, these are the SI, these are the, these symmetry function values are the SI in this equation, in the numerator of that equation. So that's the value of the symmetry function, which remember is one if you're in the solid and zero if you're in the liquid. The summations here run over all of the atoms in the system. And then I have a Gaussian kernel which is um, centered at the position of that atom. So if you look at this thing, what this is doing is saying, in this particular position, calculate the average degree of solidness um, at that point. So what I've gone from is a discrete model of what, um, a discrete point-based model, which says in this part of the box, the atom is solid, and in this part of the box, the atom is liquid, to a now a continuous model. So I have at every point in the box, um, a value for this solidity or liquidity parameter. And this means that I can then insert that into that density model and I can find the position, I can find the contours and find the positions of the interface that separate the solid from the liquid. And so this is yet another thing that we've, we've implemented in Plume. And for anyone who's interested, this is what the input file for a calculation like that looks like. So this first line, the one FCC cubic, calculates that symmetry function value for all of the atoms. This second line, multi colvar density, um, calculates and constructs that phase field that I talked about, so that, um, that function of the Gaussian kernels. And then this line here finds the isocontour. And then I can print that out to a grid and I can look at that, um, that contour and I can do various forms of analysis that might appear in cap capillary fluctuation theory. So again, this is uh, you know, a moderately complicated example of something that you can do with this piece of software plumed that you might not want to implement in a piece of software like Gromax, which already has a lot of complexity. You can do these sorts of calculations within plumed instead. So I have a second example of something that we did um, recently. So this one was about using entropy as a collective variable um, in simu simulations of uh, um, the crystallization of pharmaceuticals. But this, this idea of using entropy as a CV has appeared in other places and people have been using this to look at sort of distributions of bond vectors in uh, biological systems like proteins, for instance. Okay, so this again was a collaboration. Um, in this case, it was a collaboration. I met these two gentlemen, Gianpaolo Gobo and Michael Bellucci, at a conference, um, and they asked if it would be possible to, to do what I'm going to talk about using Plumed, and I said, I think so. Um, and they worked for Bernhard Trout, and there, Giovanni Ciccotti was also involved in this work. Okay, so what they were interested in was the basically crystallization from the melt of pharmaceutical compounds. And the sort of prototypical example of these uh, pharmaceutical compounds and this process of crystallization from the melt, which has been studied extensively in the literature, is urea. Okay, and it seems it, it works, a lot of these techniques work very nicely for urea. So the problem with looking at uh, molecules rather than and and is that rather than say a transition from gas to liquid is that what we're interested in molecules is not really a change of the density of the structure so what i've got in this graph is the radial distribution function for the centers of masses of the urea molecules in liquid urea which is shown in blue and in solid urea which is shown in, shown in green here and you can see like the the peaks in those 
um, radial distribution functions, they're not really shifting. It's not that atoms are coming closer together. It's not that the molecules are getting closer together when you form the liquid from the solid. And we know this, this is obvious. We know what really happens when you form a solid crystal from a liquid crystal is that you get orientational order. So the, the molecules line up in some ways. And you see this really clearly if you look at the relative orientations of the CO bonds in these urea molecules. So the green line again here is the solid and the blue line is the liquid. So you see clearly that there is sort of a uniform distribution for that angle between the um, CO atoms on adjacent urea molecules. If you're in the liquid, that distribution is essentially uniform. Whereas if you're in the solid, you really have peaks. So the urea molecules are either, either have their COs pointing in the same direction or pointing in opposite directions. And this is very nice. What you can do is you can construct a function that looks like this. So you have some function of the angle between um, the urea molecule, between those CO bonds. Uh, this is the theta in that expression. And this function is just something that has, is a function that has peaks on where you see the solid peaks in the, the urea. So it's the dashed line, the, the dotted line in that middle figure. And then you multiply that by the, some switching function and you average that over the first coordination sphere. And when you do that, you beautifully see that um, the liquid has a very low value for this average quantity. You don't have a lot of, um, of molecules that are aligned that are next to each other. And the, the solid in green has a high value for this quantity. And you have a nice separation between these two regimes. So, um, what Giampaolo and Michael had done before they involved me is they tried to apply this to a different system. They tried try to apply this to benzene, and what they and they'd done it in two dimensions. And what they'd seen is stuff like this. So here, what you've got on the right is you've got a structure in the bottom which is clearly disordered, just visually, and at the top you've got a structure that is clearly ordered. And what I'm showing you here is the distribution of distances and angles between adjacent molecules in these two systems. So this is just doing this over all of the atoms. And in particular, the sort of the colored part is the instantaneous distribution in those two configurations on the right. And the black part is the distribution that you see in the crystal. And the interesting thing that they'd observed was that even though in this, even though in this disordered crystal, the distribution is more similar to that of the ordered system than the distribution that you see in this clearly ordered system at the top. So that one, so this one, the top one looks disordered when it, if you look at the CV, when it's actually ordered, whereas the bottom one looks ordered when it's actually disordered. So because of this trying to fit these Gaussian, because basically what you're doing is essentially counting how often you fall into one of those modes, this doesn't really seem to work particularly well for some of these more complicated systems. So what um, they were interested, what uh, Michael and Giampaolo were interested in is can we compare the distribution directly? So rather than constructing this surrogate that basically looks at how often we fall into those modes. So, you know, we, we have these um, triangular kernels that measure whether or not we're close to the orientations we see in the solid. Can we instead just compare the distributions directly? Um, so obviously this distribution, this is the distribution of distances and angles in the liquid, that's on the left of the slide. And the one on the right of the slide is the distribution in the solid. Uh, and uh, obviously these are very different, so you would hope that you could, if you compared those, you would have something that when you're close to a solid is small and when you're close to a liquid is big. And the way that you can compare two distributions is using this thing called the kublik leibler divergence, which is calculated using this expression here. So here you have an integral over all space. In this, in, for these particular two distributions, it would be a two-dimensional integral. 
and you basically in, integrate the instantaneous distribution, which is the P of X, and the Q of X is some reference distribution. So we went and we implemented this in plumed. We also have forces for this quantity, so you can do a bias on this callback Liebler divergence. And this is what the input looks like. In this particular case, we're using um, a uniform distribution as the reference. So you see, you calculate your CVs, you construct a histogram show basically of how those CV, an instantaneous histogram of how those, um, those CVs are distributed instantaneously, and then you integrate that histogram, um, uh, or you integrate that histogram multiplied by the reference distribution that you've input. And again, this is a quite complicated um, piece of um, programming, you know, a reasonably moderately complicated piece of programming that you might not want to, to have to redo in all these different codes. So that brings me to the the last part of the talk where I'm, I'll talk about where we see this, this plumed thing going. So I start at the beginning by talking about this distinction between the software users and the software developers and how as developers as plumed, we see ourselves more in the, in the space between that. So we mainly focused on trying to develop applications, but in order to develop the applications we want, we often have to do a little bit of programming in order to, to, to get things up and running. And what we've realized from doing this for the last 10 years is that we're not alone in this space. There's actually many, many um, people in the community who are in this sort of limbo between users of software and developers of software. And so in order to um, facilitate those people and celebrate this fact that we're all in this, this limbo, we recently started this plumed consortium. Um, we have members from all the countries shown on this map here. We have about uh, 70 members at the moment. And the idea of the Plume Consortium is that we want to promote the development of this open source plugin software Plumed. We've been very lucky so far in that people have decided to use it and, and, and take it on. And we want to encourage other people to contribute to it as well as just us. And at the same time, we also want to promote scientific reproducibility and good behavior. So, um, from early on within the development of this plume, we organized a workshop. We've organized a number of workshops and user meetings about the, the methods and the code within plumed. These have always been very successful and we want to continue doing these things and basically teaching people how to, to use these methods because that's an important aspect of what we're doing. And we hope that the plumed consortium will um, allow us to, to facilitate these objectives. So what does this actually mean in terms of the development of plumed? Well, the first thing it means is that we no longer just have this plumed core developed by these four people, me, Max, Carlo and Giovanni. We do have that, but in addition, we have modules that people have contributed. And um, we now have seven of these that have been contributed by, uh, well, six that have been contributed by other people and one that has been contributed by a subset of the four of us. Um, and these sit, in, sit within Plumed and you can, you, when you download the code, you, auto, you automatically have access to all the pieces of software that these other people have developed. And we encourage anyone to, to contribute what they've done. The only things that we ask, the only thing we ask is if you want to contribute a module, make sure you have regression tests um, that test the functionality within it and make sure it's suitably documented. Um, and, and try to answer. If there are questions about your module on the Plume mailing list, try to answer them. So that's the first thing is we're, we're moving away from this model of development that is based on a small core of developers working on this piece of code to a model of development that is really based on people contributing functionality that is explained and um, curated within this um, plumed repository. The second thing that we've done is we started this uh, plumed nest. So the idea of this was to basically um, build a repository of the data needed to reproduce the calculations that are in papers. This has been done in a very sort of plumed style. So um, there's many people working on repositories and they have um, you know, a lot invested a lot of money in the sort of storage aspect. We're sort of tagging on top of that. 
we're not building a repository to store the files, um, the information. You use something like, you could use GitHub or Materials Cloud or Nomad, whichever um, one of these databases out there. What Plumed Nest will do is grab that data and basically build um, a page about the way that you have used Plumed in your calculations. And the idea of this is that um, users can learn from real life examples, we can promote scientific reproducibility and we can create educational material. And this has been quite popular. We launched this uh, maybe four months ago when we already have 64 pieces of work within um, the repository. So how does it work? Let's suppose that you've done some piece of work using Plumed. You come to our website, Plumed Nest, you click on contribute and it gives you a form to fill in. And you can see that you give your project a name, it assigns a, an ID to you. That where it says URL, that's where you put in where to download the zip file. And I've been told it's very important that I explain that it's a zip file um, that Plumed will go looking for the Plumed input files within. You say which, are, which files within that are the plumed input files, and then you provide a little bit of detail about what the calculation you did, and ideally a DOI for the publication that you've generated, that this data is part of. Um, once we get that information, we, the, we then build a page that appears on the browse section. So if you click browse, you get a list of all the um, input files that people have contributed, a table that looks something like this. If we pick one of these in particular, this is what you find. So it gives you details of the calculation, where you can download the data from, so the zip file that you can get the data from, the publication that this was part of, and then you have within that the plumed input, these links that will take you to the plumed input files that were used to do the calculation. And the nice thing is that we regularly check basically if the calculations that you've submitted to the nest are still valid plumed inputs so you know the code is changing as as time progresses but we actually make the effort this this is using the server to basically test that those inputs are still compatible with um the way that the, with the with the current version of plumed and you get these badges you know that it, in this case, the first one of those inputs is working with the latest stable version, version 2.5, and with the master branch of the code. So nice and straightforward. So we're trying to expand on this um, at the moment and make these inputs a little bit more, um, have more information in the nest. So this is something that we're in the early stages of doing. So at the moment, each of those green words is a link to the appropriate page in the documentation. So if you click on group, it will take you to the manual page of Plumed for group. So from the Plumed Nest website directly to the Plumed um, manual pages. That's fine, but maybe you lose a little bit of context and you want to look at the whole thing together. You just want to find out what a keyword is. So what we're trying to do is make it so that these um, uh, all of the keywords within here are tooltips. So if you go and hover over this radius um, keyword, for instance, a tooltip comes up that tells you what that um, what that radius command is doing. So that's what we're working on. Uh, and another aspect of this is in terms of the quantities being calculated. Um, so for example, if you if you make it if you click on the restraint one down here, it will tell you it will show you basically in red where that command is being used in the input file and what quantities are are included within that restraint and, and a little bit about um, what they are. So for example here, when you click on that restraint, it tells you that the restraint action with the label restraint calculates a quantity called restraint.bias, which is the instantaneous value of the bias potential, and restraint.force2, which is the instantaneous value of the squared force due to this bias potential. Okay, so kind of useful again for a user who's maybe new to the code to, to basically be able to probe and understand based on inputs rather than having to read uh, the dense old manual because we all know that no one really reads the manuals. So this is our attempt um, to address this kind of 
crisis in reproducibility that we, we have in the field. And our sort of feeling is that part of the reason for this crisis is the nature of the way that science is done, which is maybe quite unusual if you compare it to other fields. So, you know, if you think about um, the typical scientific career, you, you start off as a student um, and you finish as a member of faculty. And uh, as you go through, as you go through that process, you learn more and more about basically how to run calculations and how to do things and the sorts of things that go wrong. But at the same time, and in parallel to that process of learning, you also find that you have progressively less and less time to do things. And in fact, that sort of process of going from being a student to being a member of faculty happens in, um, in not a terrific amount of time. You're talking 10, 15 years normally. Um, and so, you know, we have this very fast turnaround of the people who are doing the, the actual calculations. And so what, what we're trying to, what, the way that to solve this reproducibility crisis, I think, is to build into the way that we work, ways of ensuring that when someone who is new to the field comes to look at those calculations later, they can more quickly understand what was done than um, the people who did it in the first place. And uh, with that, I'll finish and invite um, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gareth. Could you please uh, change to the slide showing how people can... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I can, I have the question slide. There it is. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again for the great presentation. It was uh, really interesting to see um, the big efforts that uh, some people are making, not only on the code side, but also tackling things like reproducibility and community building. Uh, these are some of the aspects that uh, also in Barcel we are very interested that we are encouraging and in supporting that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, so I encourage everybody to use the questions tab to, to write your questions there and I will let you uh, speak to Garrett. Uh, I have to send Garrett your the regards by Roshan Shrestha who especially thankful for your notes on free energy calculations and he sends his oh, regard. Okay, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, we have a question from Partivan. Just a moment. Okay. I will see mm -hmm. if, uh, his audio. Uh, so I don't see the questions. Uh, can you see them? No. Ah, yeah, well, uh, part one, can you hear us? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. great. So you can speak. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, how can you define uh, the classical and uh, in, what is the difference between the classical and the enhanced MD? And how can you define it to a biologist? Okay. Um, so uh, if if you're doing, so when we, when we talk about Ah, that's a very difficult question. Um, so it depends how you, how you ask the, answer the question. So in a very naive, naive way, if we're talking about um, plumed, we could, we could, if we were being a bit more immodest, uh, if I'm allowed to be modest for a moment, we could say that the classical MD, the standard MD would be, um, you go and you run your calculation just with whatever MD code you're using. Okay. Um, and the enhanced version would you would be you run it with that MD code with plumed inside. As I said, that's the immodest answer. Um, I think a, a division that people would normally would often use is we have this problem of what's called rare event sampling. So there are certain processes that take a very long time, and we can only run MD for a very short amount of time, and Obviously, if we run a short MD simulation, we don't see those processes occur. So I'm talking here about processes like protein folding, which take place on time scale of seconds, or processes like nucleation of crystals, which again takes a very long time for it to occur. So there's no way that we're going to see that event if we run a simulation for uh, you know, 100 nanoseconds. So okay. 
in order to resolve that problem, we add additional forces in order to force that event to happen on a much shorter time scale. And that's what a lot of people talk about when they talk about enhanced MD, and enhanced okay. Uh, sampling. Okay. Uh, the follow-up question is, uh, will, uh, will this fall into a category of this biased or unbiased uh, simulation? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So biased and versus unbiased simulation. But, okay. It, okay. but when, you in, when, when you enhance it, it doesn't necessarily always have to be with a simulation bias. There are also methods like um, transition path sampling, which you wouldn't necessarily do with plume. There are other codes for that, um, okay. where essentially what you do is run lots of different molecular dynamics trajectories, and then you do a kind of um, metropolis in trajectory space. Or um, methods like, I'm trying to think of another one. Or a method like forward flux sampling, where you run calculations and periodically stop lots of calculations, periodically stop them, and then um, and then see whether some have done things that you're interested in, and then you throw away all the ones that are not doing anything interesting, roughly speaking. Okay. Does okay. that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, we have a question by. June, let's see. Um, June, can we hear each other? June, hello. Uh, oh, maybe no. he has an audio. Yeah. Okay, so I'll read his question. Does the entropy procedures mm -hmm. and inputs have to be included in the nest? If not, um, when would you expect to see it? It has it been included in the nest? Uh, that's a good question. Did I put that in the nest? Um, I don't think I did actually. And thank you for reminding. I, I I should put that in there. Yes. So I don't think I did it yet. No. But there are, if I remember correctly, there is there is information in the supporting information of the paper as to what the input files look like. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then we have a question by Marcelo. Marcelo, mm -hmm. do you have a microphone? Uh, okay, I'll read his question. Okay. Besides multiple walkers, which other protocols deal with a single CV with slow convergence? Besides multiple walkers? Yes. Um, so, so things like metadynamics would be one. Umbrella sampling, um, uh, steered MD. The problem with steered MD is you're not going to get a a, um, a um, free energy surface out of it unless you use a Jalzinski inequality, uh, which is very difficult to converge. Uh, variationally enhanced sampling would be another. I mean, there's a there's a zoo of different methods that you can use for um, basically enhancing sampling. Even even something like along a slow CV, even even a method like parallel tempering would would work, where you're you know you're swapping between replicas at different temperatures. And so the the high temperature replicas are taking you over the barriers, and the lower temperature replicas are sampling inside the basins that you're interested in. So, yes, um, mm -hmm. I'd recommend looking at some of the reviews on on these techniques. Okay, thanks. And uh, Marcel has one more question: Is there input in the nest for calculations of six ring members or five ring members occurring? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. There are examples in the manual. I think. Mm -hmm. um, then there is a question by Roshan Sreshta. I don't know if his audio works. Let's see. Uh, hi, Roshan. Oh. Hi, hi, hi. Gareth, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for your notes that you provided on my email. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, okay, my question is, okay, thank you. My question is like, why for now in this webinar, we are only talking about metadenoms, right? Why, I'm um, sorry, yeah, sorry, can you just repeat no, the question? On, on, sure, sure, sure. I mean, on this webinar, you are only talking about metadenoms, so while there are all enhanced sampling, uh, simulated annealing and rimmed as well. So I just want to understand what makes metadynamics better or good enhanced sampling technique uh, than others, or it depends on the system or processes we are just studying right now. Okay, um, so why am I, why do I talk about metadynamics? Um, I talk about metadynamics because it's what I know. You're working it, yeah. <laughs> That's what I use personally. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. The, there are other methods uh, out there. There's, there's a huge number of different methods out there. Yeah. The, the nice thing with metadynamics is a lot of other people use it. So it, it has mm -hmm. recognition. Um, when you when you when you publish a paper and you say I did this using metadynamics, people know what that means. They know how the mm -hmm. method works. They have some intuition as to what is going on in the paper. And, yeah, and sure. there, there has also been that work on basically looking at how the free energy surface that you get out and how the performance of the method depends on the parameters. It sometimes isn't there for some other methods. Not all of the methods, but many methods that is there. Um, yes. So that's uh, that's one reason. But yeah, the reason the reason that I speak about metadynamics is that it, it's what I know. Um, thank you. Thank you. So uh, there was one more question by uh, June, which is: okay. uh, uh, Are there any additional efforts to elaborate Plunk with the recent Boltzmann generator? Apparently, Frank Noe and other authors mentioned such possibility in particular um so the which which one the what, uh, what the, the frank noe was talking about uh, about uh, some recent uh, boltzmann generator i i don't know exactly what it means but that's the question okay okay so uh, there is a more from john there's been a science paper on Boltzmann generator, John Wright. Okay. And uh, they so there's been a science paper on the Boltzmann generator, and he's wondering whether there are plans to um, extend plummet with that. Um, I I wouldn't really. I, I mean, I wouldn't really. The the, the short answer is no, um, but there may be. It may be that. Frank Noe and, and company have plans to to contribute this to Plume that I'm, but I'm not not aware of. Um, mm -hmm. This is the 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 advantage and the disadvantage of this community development uh, to a certain extent is that obviously you don't exactly know what's going on in the future. Um, yeah, and people are free to. And people are free to. So mm -hmm. it, it may appear, it may not. Yeah. Um, I was uh, actually wondering, because uh, we're very interested in like the high performance aspects of MD, uh, I guess it depends on the type of plugin that you have, but uh, mm -hmm. to what extent uh, the extensions affect the performance, the raw performance, the scalability of uh, the MD engines? So it, it very much depends um, on on the application, like you say. The the big thing that would slow stuff down a lot is if you try and pass all of the atoms into plumed. That's going to slow it down a lot. But for most bio applications where you're looking at a, a small molecule in a lot of water and you're just interested in passing the atoms in the small molecule, this is not a big worry that you know the the plume is not causing you an enormous slowdown but again it's it's one of these things where to a certain extent you i mean and this is another reason for doing all this stuff to do the reproducibility aspects is the you know the there's such a zoo of architectures and machines out there that you you need to spend quite a bit of time 
working out how to optimize the compilation, especially if you've got multiple bits and pieces working together. So it would be really useful in the future to sort of share the efforts in that direction, as well as the efforts of um, what the input files are and you know, so mm. on. Indeed. Uh, thanks. Uh, I don't see any other questions. There is only a question regarding the recording. Uh, yes, right. as with all of our webinars, uh, soon after, maybe later today or tomorrow, we will post a recording on our YouTube channel and on the main website. So for those of you who have joined um, later, halfway through the talk, uh, you will have an opportunity to listen uh, through the whole presentation again. Uh, and as well, you can check out some of our other webinars in the YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to tell you about our next webinar. Could you go to the next slide, Garrett? Thanks. Mm -hmm. So in a couple of weeks time, we will have a presentation by Berg Hess, one of the core developers of Gromox, who will present uh, a, a new method for uh, weighted histograms uh, accelerated sampling implemented in Gromox. And those of you who are interested in sampling methods, this will be a very interesting and useful talk, uh, we believe. So you're uh, welcome to attend this webinar as well. And uh, with that, I would like to thank Gareth again, and uh, we look forward to new developments in Plumpt. Okay. Thanks for thank the you. presentation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone.